Oh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff introduced his vision for the America's Armed Forces in the next century, a document called Joint Vision 2010. This year, we are introducing the follow-on document to that, the concept for future joint operations. And we'll have copies of that available for you after the briefing. It's my pleasure to introduce Brigadier General Bob Dees, the Acting Director of Operational Plans and Interoperability on the Joint Staff. General Dees. Good afternoon. I'll provide a few uh, introductory comments, and then uh, we'll entertain your questions. As uh, Colonel Thurston mentioned, uh, last July, the chairman published Joint Vision 2010. Joint Vision 2010, about a 38-page document that uh, talks to some operational concepts proposed for the future force, specifically for the year 2010. The concept is that without a vision, the people perish, and that the, it is necessary for the Department of Defense uh, to have a vision that uh, unifies our efforts towards future force capabilities. This uh, document was put on the street, and over the last year, a significant amount of effort has gone into fleshing out the concepts in Joint Vision 2010. As you may recall, some of you I know are familiar with those. One of the concepts, uh, or there's really four concepts uh, that are dominant maneuver, precision engagement, focus logistics, and full dimensional protection. And those are enabled by two powerful ideas. The, uh, the technological innovation that we've seen uh, as a powerful force in our uh, military development. And then secondly, information superiority. Uh, clearly, as we enter the information age, it is important that we capitalize upon uh, the benefits, uh, the necessity, really, for information superiority. So that, in essence, is uh, Joint Vision 2010. And we have uh, developed those concepts over this past year through a series of seminars, a series of uh, sync service agency uh, participation at uh, senior levels to determine uh, what those concepts truly mean, to flesh out the concepts. We think an important precept as we head towards this vision is that we must uh, work the intellectual challenges, get the concepts pretty well defined, before we move to the next step of physical change, actual experimentation, and turning the concepts into capabilities. The resulting product of the last year of effort I describe is the concept for future joint operations. The concept for future joint operations will be referred to as the CFJO. The CFJO is a uh, more detailed document. In this case, we have uh, 89 pages now. And it puts meat on the bones of the Joint Vision 2010. The concept for future joint operations uh, tries to describe in far greater detail the concepts I mentioned. And then it also talks to the implications. Uh, looking at doctrine, looking at the implications of future organizations, looking at how we train the future force, looking at the leadership required for the future force. The leaders of the task force of 2010 are currently majors in our intermediate staff colleges. What are we teaching and training, educating uh, those majors to do in this future force? And then we have the materiel aspect. The point is that we have long lead times generally associated with materiel development, and consequently we need to be looking at the materiel implications of those concepts. And finally, people. We recognize that the future or the current quality of our force is based on the quality of our people as our very bedrock that must persist into the future. Our people are our key. And it is not people versus technology, but it is people enabled by technology in our future force that is truly the key to our success. Now, we have this thing called the QDR that uh, intervened in the process. Uh, the QDR uh, was concurrent with the development of the concept for future joint operations. When the QDR reported out, the QDR placed significant emphasis to the proper implementation of Joint Vision 2010. The National Defense Panel on 15 May issuing its report concurrent with the QDR publication talked also to the necessity to strengthen the, the Joint Vision 2010 uh, considerations in future force development in the Department of Defense. Um, 
Now, where do we go from here? We've had the QDR that talks to three pillars of the strategy, the third pillar being uh, shaping the future. Joint Vision 2010 and the implementation of Joint Vision 2010, enabled thus far by the two documents I've described, is the key to shaping that future, and, and hence it, uh, the, this publication of the concept is a significant next step in shaping the future of the Armed Forces of the United States. Uh, I will talk to the concept for just a moment, and then I will also talk to what we're going to do with it. Uh, when you look at the concept and you look at uh, the four uh, concepts I described, the dominating maneuver, precision engagement, it is not sufficient as in the past to simply look at these in isolation, but the true power in the future and the true power in this concept is the synergistic application of all four of these concepts uh, at the same time using information superiority as a backdrop. Now, how do we prove out these concepts? Well, it's important as we move from this document uh, to the next phase uh, to prove out the concepts. Are the concepts in here correct or incorrect? It's, it's probably the real question is, how do we mature these concepts in this living document? Well, we intend to mature it in the next step in an iterative experimental process that will be an approach to looking at war games, looking at the academic uh, developments, uh, looking at uh, actual command post exercises, actual field exercises, to experiment with the concepts, determine how those concepts pair up to certain hypotheses that we've developed, and then to iteratively experiment again with what we have learned and to, over time, mature these concepts until we prove them out and we truly want to put them into the force of the future. Well, that's probably enough in terms of introduction. It's a significant step. It is the primary means by which the Department of Defense and the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the SYNC services and agencies will shape the future. And so I uh, commend it to uh, our collective attention and I'm glad to take your questions. Please. Uh, what I'm wondering is the steps that you recommend, uh, both operationally, personnel, and technology-wise, are you assuming that all this be done in the existing funding parameters that we are assuming for the Pentagon, or will this require either an increase of budget, or, or will it allow a decrease in budget levels? Um, I can't answer your question directly yet. Uh, we, we do not know the resource impacts at this point in time. What I will say, though, is that some have asked uh, can we afford Joint Vision 2010? Uh, the real question is, can we afford not to do Joint Vision 2010? Because we think Joint Vision 2010 is the most efficient way, the most uh, cost-effective way, to get to the future capabilities that our future environment requires. I didn't speak to the future environment uh, very much, but suffice it to say that we are developing these capabilities because the future environment that we postulate as depicted in the QDR, as depicted in the Joint Strategy Review, requires that we have a broad spectrum of capabilities, of everything from peacekeeping all the way up to the highest end of warfare, and we must be able to operate uh, very agilely, very rapidly, uh, to deal decisively with threats around the world. And when I say threats, it's not necessarily the threats of times past uh, of pre-Cold War or uh, Cold War type threats that you would think of, but it's uh, perhaps also asymmetric threats that combine uh, criminality uh, armed with weapons of mass destruction, uh, empowered by terrorist uh, operational concepts of times past, uh, and then also uh, empowered with information age technologies, which uh, comprise a very potent cocktail of asymmetric threat in the future that we must deal with. That it is that type of threat that we need to posture our forces to deal with across a very broad spectrum. Please. Um, <clears throat> let's, uh, let's talk about a threat that uh, may exist already and certainly is coming soon, and there's, there's several of those around the world, but let's talk about North Korea. A missile uh, threat to Japan uh, and to our forces in Japan, and I understand at present we have three batteries of Patriot 3s, which may or may not be effective against these missiles. Don't we need 
these, uh, of these theater missiles uh, uh, developed now are certainly, uh, uh, how does that fit into your 210 concept? Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll follow. Okay, well, good, thanks. The, uh, one of the precepts or one of the concepts in Joint Vision 2010 is full dimensional protection. Now that goes from protection of the individual soldier with high-tech body armor that, uh, with new laminates and things. It also goes to the, to the highest dimension to include uh, ballistic missile defense. Uh, we think it is a very serious threat, as you highlight, and we also are working very hard on it. The Joint Staff has just uh, stood up under the Chairman's direction an organization called JTAMDO, which is, uh, is going to look at the theater missile defense. It pulls together some of the previous efforts doing that. Uh, we also uh, recognize in the world of uh, aviation, for instance, that uh, some of our aviation has in the past been vulnerable to surface-to-air missiles. And so that, uh, a bit lower from ballistic missile defense, you would go to maybe tactical missile defense. And, and we are, are developing new equipment that will protect us uh, from that type of missiles. So we take the threat as seriously as you do, and the Department of Defense is working not only on the concepts of full dimensional protection that Joint Vision 2010 will drive, but also working on the technologies uh, to enable those concepts. As I mentioned, you've got four con or six critical considerations, doctrine, organization, material, training, leadership, and people. We have to co-evolve all of those and bring them together to solve any particular issue to include ballistic missile defense. Yes, please. Uh, this concentrates a lot and will rely a lot on information. Correct. Uh, recently, the IEEE released a, a study. The who? IEEE, uh, Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Basically, the first time anybody looked at what many of us have talked about, information overload, and found that the overflow of information is literally making people sick. Mm -hmm. uh, is there going to be a point beyond which we can't go or is there something we can do because of this emphasis on information to uh, uh, avoid getting falling into that trap where we, we're just putting too much on the individual uh, soldier to, mm -hmm. uh, to do their job? Well, it's a good question. Uh, we have a lot of concern also about information overload. A lot of experiments going on in various sectors to uh, determine the impact of information overload. We think that uh, as we properly implement information technology into our force, that good information technology allows for discrimination among information so that the decision maker in particular receives that information which he needs and is not deterred from uh, important pieces of information by less relevant information that, quote, overloads him. Now, as we look at information superiority and how we achieve information superiority, we are taking, uh, we are going to school on industry that has done a lot of good work. You look at uh, Walmart, and if you look at the Walmart, they are truly an information-based organization that uh, taps into the power of, uh, uh, Cray, of uh, Cray computers. In fact, they have more Cray computers in Walmart than any other organization outside of the Department of Defense to manage a real-time information uh, capability so that they know what the customer wants and they supply what the customer needs and wants in almost real time. The president of GE, for instance, has said that when, when Walmart sells a light bulb, we make a light bulb, indicating the, the, the critical linkages between the, the consumer and the demand and what the production base provides. Now that's unprecedented in the industry. Another one is that in the world of bond trading you have several firms that are providing a real-time information capability that allows them competitive edge in their particular industry. As we have looked at some of these in industry initiatives, we find that they have some things in common. They have an information grid, a sensor grid, and an engagement grid, uh, and I'm putting military uh, terms on those, but with these three grids, you can allow information to be available, but not necessarily information to be forced upon any particular decision maker. And so he can choose what information he receives, and therefore he can selectively avoid information overload that you refer to. 
it's a, a pretty deep and wide subject. Uh, information overload is one of the considerations out of many that we're, we're working in that area. Please, Steve. General, uh, when I read these reports, there's, there's a lot of exciting stuff down in the future, but uh, what doesn't seem to get covered is uh, what should be given up. Is there something that we do now, that the U.S. military does now, analogous to the horse cavalry that at a certain point in time was just obsolete and eliminated? Is there, is there something analogous to that now? I, uh, I can say yes, but I can't tell you what that is. <laughs> Okay, because uh, that's the purpose of this endeavor, is to prove out the concepts, is to look at organizational structure, which is the example you use, and as we go through an iterative experimental process, to determine if, in fact, that organization is now a dinosaur and should be far more compact, far more agile, uh, perhaps cut out layers of command, uh, add different types of organizations or command structures. Uh, so that's part of the process that we're going through uh, between now and the year 2010. We, we are doing a lot of things exactly right now in the Department of Defense. The, the important thing with Joint Vision 2010 implementation is that we create unity of effort so we head towards the future in an efficient way and we also head towards the future and establish the capabilities that we need to address a future requirement without eliminating uh, some of the very good things that are, are going on right now that should continue to go on into the future. Please. Uh, somebody else got a question? Let me, let me go into the, uh, a strategic issue. Mm -hmm. uh, that being uh, the, uh, the, the challenges uh, uh, to peace uh, in, uh, in places such as Middle East, growing challenges in, in Middle East, uh, Iran and uh, Iraq. Uh, the growing challenge to, uh, to stability uh, in, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, in the far Pacific and the, in the Western Pacific, specifically Korea and, and China, uh, and uh, uh, say India, uh, Pakistan, uh, a few other places around the world like Bosnia. Uh, sir, what about projecting uh, uh, the, 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 the gathering storms of, uh, of the next decade? Okay. Um, it's a good question. I would, uh, I don't want to get too far afield, but uh, let me address it briefly. Uh, the, the Quadrennial Defense Review had three pillars to the strategy, and it was shape, respond, prepare. What you allude to, first of all, is the shaping function. We, we simply must engage day in and day out around the world to allow us to increase stability, thereby preventing the probability of needing to respond uh, to instability. Now, as, as we do that shaping function, we must consider what the requirements of that function are as we develop the future force. The future force not only has to be able to fight and win, the future force has to be able to engage, has to be able to shape and enhance stability uh, in those areas of the world that you describe as well. Please. Yeah, I'd like to draw you uh, to the technology side uh, Good. for a sec. Um, the, I'm kind of curious because if you want a lot of these things implemented by 2010 or have an operation, be operational, ready to go by 2010, given the long lead time you need for everything in this building, uh, some of these things have to get moving pretty quickly. And I'm struck there by the uh, reference here to the low observable and masking technologies. I'm kind of curious if you can give us a time frame of when you see those uh, being fielded or in EMD kind of phase or you know, basically coming along. Mm -hmm. Well, I won't address specifics, but I will address in general terms a couple of things. Uh, there are uh, low observable technologies that are being developed now, and, and there's some already available. That will continue, obviously, and that's an important aspect of the materiel aspect of Joint Vision 2010. Additionally, the Defense Science Board, for instance, is looking at that specific subject uh, in one of their summer studies. So there are people uh, that are investigating this and investigating the next steps, recognizing the importance of that whole area of low observables and the, uh, the aspect of uh, if 
if you can see something in the future war and environment that we're talking about, it, you can probably kill it. And so uh, masking um, your signature in various ways is critical to the future force uh, survivability and hence to the full dimensional protection aspect of the mission as well as uh, precision engagement and dominant maneuver. Well, let me follow up then. I mean, there's a, a lot of the things you talk about in technologies here are, are fairly you know, broad categories, smarter technologies, long range precision capability. Of, of all those, the low observable masking technology ones, you, you get into the most, you kind of give, you get pretty specific what you're looking at, you know, uh, passive IR, uh, uh, active RF. And I'm wondering why you singled those out and didn't, uh, then on the other hand, on smarter weapons or long range precision, talk about hypersonics. I mean, what was it about that that made it worth singling out like this? I, I don't think that. Uh there's a reason for that. I think uh, low observables are less well understood than the precision engagement where people saw munitions going down chimneys in Operation Desert Storm. And so I think the, the concept includes some examples to let people understand the broad categories we're talking to. As you discuss the future force, just one final comment on low observables. You know, you, you, I've talked about flexibility in the force. One of the challenges may be to create something that can be seen at some point in time and not seen at other points in time. And so that that represents a, a higher level of technology that perhaps one would want to pursue because you need the flexibility and the force. Sometimes for engagement purposes, to make an impression, you need to be seen. Other times, if you're actually uh, fighting or someone's shooting at you, you would like not to be seen. And so uh, technology would uh, seek to serve those dual purposes in a single platform. Please. Yeah, a lot of these concepts are relatively purple across the board. Uh, is there going to be any way of divvying out to the various services parts of this to make one service more responsible for some part than the other? Or how will that work in the future? We're working through the specifics of exactly how we will um, divide the labor on the vision. First of all, let me emphasize that the services are already embarked upon their own experimentation programs, their own con conceptual development towards their visions and towards Joint Vision 2010. The services in this past year have come on uh, strongly in support of Joint Vision 2010 and in the need for developing jointness in the future force. Now, as we proceed further, uh, we will, as I have said, conduct experiments it will be necessary down the pike to define who's in charge of those experiments. It could be a service in some cases. It could be a sink in other cases. It could be an agency in other cases. Uh, so we will, we, will, uh, we will determine that as we go through the design of the particular experiment, determining who is best qualified to conduct that, uh, and then we will move out. Please. I'll follow it. Do you see anything like maybe a competition between concepts with, with different services to see which one works better or anything of that nature? I'm not for sure I'd use the co word competition. I'd use the word synergism. Uh, we seek to leverage what is already going on in the services. Uh, we seek to coordinate that so that we don't have redundancies or repetition. And then we seek to fill the gaps, if necessary, with uh, unique joint experimentation that is not being conducted uh, in the respective services. Please. Um, another threat that you're going to be dealing with certainly more at the time is the cruise missile threat. Uh, you've been working on that, I think, separately besides this. I'm wondering uh, how the uh, cruise missile operational architecture, I think, is what you're working on. This uh, fit together or, or where they are separate, where they address, address, address different issues. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not. Uh, properly versed in the, the latest status of the cruise missile development, I'd prefer not to speak to that. Okay, thank you. Please, Steve. Is, is any of this uh, uh, in the future going to be left to allies to accomplish? It's important that in the future we team with our allies. I, I wouldn't term it the way you have in terms of left to allies to accomplish. I, certainly we have partnerships with many allies around the world. We have collective missions. We would expect that we will divide labor on those missions as we 
do now. Uh, we would expect that to continue. Uh, as you look at Joint Vision 2010, I would highlight that our allies do have some concerns about widening gap in terms of technology in particular with U.S. forces. Uh, that's a valid concern on their part. Uh, we intend to address that concern very seriously. We intend to compensate for that technology gap, which may be inevitable because of the, the current status of technology in our respective nations and the funding afforded in, in the various nations. But we intend to compensate for that gap um, with other means of interoperability. The first step of interoperability is by understanding how one another operate. And so doctrine, joint and combined, is extremely important that we get on the same sheet of music. As we get on the same sheet of doctrinal music, then that empowers us to, uh, to cooperate on the battlefield, even though we may have differing technologies. A second means of, uh, of narrowing the gap uh, figuratively is to ensure that the technology that we do possess, when at all possible, is downward capable, allowing us to operate with less uh, sophisticated or mature systems, uh, thereby ensuring interoperability, even though it may be with 